Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. Today I have with me Mikhail Davis. She is the Senior Director of Strategic Analytics at Peacock, which is the streaming service from NBC Universal. Uh, Mikhail, welcome along to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. It's so great to be here. No problem. And um, you have a long and illustrious career in uh, in data and analytics and insights. And we uh, we wanted to cover kind of the things that you've learned about kind of establishing and embedding um, data and a data-driven culture in organizations, because you've seen that from different angles, different size organizations. So it'd be great to get your experience and, and hear some of the learnings you've had along the way. Uh, before we do that, um, should we, uh, let's hear a little bit about you, um, who you are, kind of um, a little bit about your background, um, and we'll take things from there. Yes, let's do that, because I think my background is a good segue into why I love establishing data driven cultures and organizations. So I began analytics about 12 years ago with an internship in digital marketing, and I really loved that. And it was my senior year of college because I was able to apply a lot of the things I was learning in college to that role. And it was like, oh, I could, it felt very real life, which I thought was great. Mm. So in school, I was learning about A-B testing and statistics. I was using SAS to write, you know, statistical modeling code and things like that. And oh. I had the opportunity to use that in that internship. So that's what really planted the seed in my interest in analytics. After that, I ended up pursuing a my first full-time job at Accenture as a technology consultant. Um, at that time, I wasn't completely sold on analytics. I knew that I liked it, but I also wanted to have the opportunity to try a lot of different things. And I knew being in the consulting field, it would allow, it would allow me to do that. Um, but with within Accenture, I did have the opportunity to work on a couple of different analytics projects. And again, I realized, you know, I really like this analytics thing. So from there, I thought, you know, it would be really awesome to combine two things that I'm passionate about. One would be analytics and data, but the other would be more on the personal side. I really had a passion for music. I grew up singing in choirs and playing classical piano. So I really wanted to figure out a way to combine the two. Okay. So I started doing a lot of digging in research, trying to find roles within music and analytics. And I just kept falling short. There was nothing there. Um, and it was a little bit frustrating. And I was like, this is so weird. How was there no roles where I can combine the two things that I really love? And then I realized, you know, in the entertainment industry as a whole, there wasn't really a lot, of, uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunity where you could combine um, entertainment world and data. But I ended up finding a role at the Cleveland Cavaliers as a business analyst. That's our um, professional basketball team in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. And I was like, you know what? Um, this isn't quite music, but it's close enough. It's the foot in the door in the entertainment industry. Mm. And it was my experience there that really planted the seed of, you know, I really like being able to be in these environments where I can establish a data driven culture in areas where it hasn't really been thought about or used mm. yet. So at the time within the sports industry as a whole, using data to drive business decisions wasn't really a thing. It was pretty sparse. On the player side, it was a little bit more common because of the popularity of the Moneyball film and movie, sorry, film and book. But on the business side, no one was really using it to drive uh, business revenue decisions. It was pretty up and coming. So during my time there, I spent time supporting uh, revenue driving areas. So how do you build ticket sales? Um, how do you drive ticket sales? How do you increase sponsorship sales? Things like that. And also supporting digital marketing. So I really enjoyed my time there. I really loved getting to know everyone there, learning about how do you learning about ticket sales, being signed with the sales leaders and understanding their pain points and using that information to help them make the better decisions with data. Um, soon after my time at the Cavs, I decided to leave for a similar opportunity to work for Legendary Entertainment. And that was another situation where it was a brand new analytics capability that was being developed to essentially find, figure out ways to optimize marketing spend. So similar to the world of sports, data wasn't commonly used on the business side of film or in TV either, especially within the marketing world. A lot of times their marketing strategy was based on age and demographics. And our charter was to help shift that mindset to think about more so targeting folks based on their interests and their behavior. So we leveraged a lot of data from a lot of different data sources to identify very micro targeted segments that we could use to promote various films and TV shows. So right. I thought that was really cool because we were able to, you know, kind of shift the culture of not only legendary, but as well as, you know, the film industry as a whole to start thinking about things in a more refined way. 
And then um, that leads me to when I joined NBC Universal. So about four years ago, I joined NBC Universal again for a similar opportunity where there was a brand new analytics being capability being developed. But this was more so focused on thinking about the business as a whole. So NB, in, sorry, <laughs> NBC Universal is comprised of a lot of different functions. There's the theme parks, there's the TV network, there's our film studios. So at that time, I joined the organization to think about the data strat strategy holistically and think about how can we leverage our data across all those different business units to drive decision making. Right. And that positioned me very well for my current role at Peacock. So given the knowledge that I was able to build about the entire organization, I was able to leverage that information to support the launch of Peacock. And now in my role as Senior Director of Strategic Analytics, our goal is to help uh, drive decision making using the data that we have to support primarily customer strategy, long range business planning, and also address executive questions that come about. Nice. Well, I, that's a great introduction because you you obviously clearly had lots of experience in those organizations where it's quite fresh and new. And there's a whole load of challenges I've seen that comes about even in organizations that have established um, uh, sort of data functions and, and data initiatives underway. But there's something kind of quite special about, you know, from scratch and sort of kind of green field. Um, so can't wait to sort of dig into some of that. I suppose it's sort of like the broad question to start with is what are some of those really important things that you have found that you kind of have to consider in that like early days of, of setting up the, the analytics um, capability, the analytics team, the function, um, so that it is a successful, but particularly I'm interested in kind of how it lands within you know, how you make it land within the organization that it sits within. So, you know, whether that's in, in as you say, in sport or in, in the entertainment, broader entertainment industry. So how, how so what are some of those things that, that you think, like looking back over all of those brilliant experiences you've had, have sort of set things apart um, that sort of made things successful? Right. That's a really good question. So I would say it really starts with thinking about the business needs first. Mm. I feel like in my experience, and especially nowadays in data and analytics, people understand that data is important. They know that they need it, but it really just stops there. A lot of people don't understand the why, like why do we need data and how do you use it? Um, so you end up in these situations where people just recognize that they have data and they just bring it in and then there's nothing you can do with it. So I think it's really important to start with the business needs first and understand why, what, are, what decisions are you trying to make with this data? Um, why do you need it? How do you plan to use it? From there, when you understand what the business needs, business needs are, you really start to think about, you know, how do I prioritize these business needs? Mm -hmm. So there are certain things that you have to understand when you're first starting up with analytics capabilities that you can't do everything all at once. Um, you're not going to have a fully established analytics function very quickly. It starts with thinking about what are the most important things to the business and then the data that you need to address those business needs and then prioritizing them. So that right. those are the things that kind of stick out to me across the board in the industry, whether it's in sports or um, film or TV or any other industry. It's really important to think about from the foundational standpoint, what are the actual business needs and going from there. And have you found that the, the the organizations you've been in have accept sort of accepted that? Is that is that have they sort of got on board with that? Have they understood that that's that's the need? Because you know you, you can kind of see the scenarios where it's like, well, let's just crack on and build some some data things, and we'll you know we'll we'll work out what to do with it. But you know that, that kind of like I sometimes call it right to left. That's starting with the outcome, starting with the need, and working back to you know things that you build and people you recruit and technology you need and that sort of stuff. Um, is that does that was that clear and understood that this was sort of the way it needed to go, or is that a lesson you learned along the way because you tried it other ways first? That's a good question. So it varies, Brad. I've been in some organizations where you know it was really not understood at all, and you really had to focus on getting buy-in. And then I've been in other organizations where um, they had a really solid understanding of the importance of data and they embraced it and loved it and had tons of questions. But in those industries and areas where it wasn't fully embraced, what I did personally was just spent time with my stakeholders building relationships with them. Mm -hmm. I think one thing is that some folks feel a little bit um, 
threatened by data because they don't understand it. And there's also a, yeah. a stigma about using data to replace. So I spent a lot of time explaining to my stakeholders that, hey, this data is here to help enhance your decision making. It's never going to replace any of that tacit or institutional knowledge that you have. It's, help, it's there to kind of supplement and help with all of your help with solving your business problem. So mm. I personally spent a lot of time just embedding myself in the culture of the, of the stakeholders. For example, at the Cavs, you know, I would spend time shadowing the ticket sales folks. I would spend time shadowing the sponsorship sales folks to understand, you know, how are they interacting with their customers? What were their various pain points? I spent a lot of time understanding how things work and partnering with them, asking tons of questions. I'm just, just a very inquisitive person in general, so it works, but I would ask a lot of questions and dig deep. A lot of times people will think they want something. When you start asking more questions, you get more clarity around, around what they truly want and need. But I think when you build a relationship with someone, that helps as well. Another thing that really helps is starting with, you know, low hanging fruit. A lot of times people want to show these really cool, fancy models that are really difficult for um, stakeholders to understand. But a lot of times what I do is think about, OK, what's something that's a quick win where it's a low level of effort and high impact and easy to understand? And if you're able to show value in a way where it's like I can explain this very clearly, is very tangible. And you can actually show the impact of how data drove that decision and helped to make something more efficient or more effective. Once you get the one quick win, it's easy to get another quick win and you can gain buying and trust within mm. specific teams and organizations as a whole. What kind of thing are you, are you referring to there? So have you got an example from either the, the Cavs or, or one of these uh, other organizations that you work with where you kind of had this, this, this burning sort of use case that, that you jumped on to show and demonstrate? the kind of the value that it could deliver yeah that's a good question so um across all of my experiences i feel like whether you're trying to support ticket sales or viewership of a film or a tv show a lot of it's about driving engagement so mm -hmm. i feel like one of the areas where i've been able to gain buy-in is just being able to show how when you learn more about customers you're able to uh, help them make better, um, not make better decisions, but help guide them into um, driving engagement, whether it's driving ticket sales or uh, increasing viewership and things like that. So that's one area that's been an area of focus. And then also um, when I was supporting digital marketing strategy within the film industry, that's another one where if you're targeting folks based solely on age and gender, um that's very broad targeting and it can be a little bit inefficient in regards to marketing spend but when we were able to uh, uh in a tactical way show the improvement on like cost per impressions and cost per views and conversion rates when we started targeting folks in a more specific way based on um, their behaviors and interests that they've shown. That was another very clear way where we were able to say, hey, instead of just targeting on age and gender, if we target based on age and gender, maybe you watched a similar TV show or film that makes you more likely to engage with our advertising. Right. You have the sort of broader context rather than just the kind of demographic of the individual or, or the cohort of people. Exactly. You mentioned um, the uh, mentioned buy in then. And, and I think sort of um, you sort of refer to that in, in terms of these examples, these early examples are to demonstrate what's possible for people that might not have seen it before and therefore get buy in. Are there some other um kind of activities or initiatives or ways that you have helped to kind of um to get that buy-in from leadership the broader stakeholders and and help to kind of um help the organization understand what the value can be and sort of really get behind what you're trying to achieve yeah, I would say it's a, a lot of what I was mentioning before. The best ways to gain buy-in is to prove the value and to build relationships. Mm -hmm. So those have been the key ways for me to establish uh, trust within the organization all the way up to the leadership level, because um, it proves that you have an understanding of the business and it proves that you actually care. And then identifying those opportunities where you're able to actually drive an impact um, shows the validity of the data. So those are the really, honestly, the true um, ways that I would recommend to uh, gain buy-in within the organization. 
does that in its own right sort of drive the culture or there or there are some other um other um ways you need to to embed this change uh, and the understanding so that the you know that that gets you off the ground that gets the buy-in initially but to kind of sustain that it needs a little bit it normally needs a little bit more in terms of culture shift have you seen have you seen yeah, any of ways course, of, of, of sort of, of so, that of that working through yeah the best the what i've seen there is that once you prove success in one area then you gain the attention of all mm-hmm. the other areas within the organization and then you fall into this role where at the beginning, it was tough to get people interested in what you were doing. And then you were able to show like a series of quick wins. And then others within other departments of the organizations were like, wait a minute, we want help with our decision making too. So I think you get this word of mouth things, sorry, word of mouth thing going, where um, if you gain buy-in from one part of the organization, and again, remember I mentioned you want to start in like the most critical area that you can. So if you're getting buy-in and respect from the most critical area of the business, then that's going to attract the attention of all the other areas of the business who want to use data to drive their decision making as well. And then I would kind of repeat that same process where it's like, you know, know, what are the uh, low level, sorry, low um, level of effort, high impact projects, and then you kind of expand to, you know, high impact and medium effort, high impact and high effort, you know, start doing that type of growth within each of the departments. And I think that's the best way to gain buy-in is like one by one, trying to implement analytics and drive value instead of trying to immediately embed in every specific organization, or sorry, every specific function within the organization. And you really have to think about strategically, how do I scale up in a way that's most effective for driving the business overall? Yeah. And you mentioned um, uh, prioritization earlier when, when we talk about the things to consider. So once you know the areas you can impact, of course, you need to prioritize them. Um, and, and is that is that a, is that a challenge or is that um, really kind of just fall out of the, the strategy of the organization? I think your your um, your role at now is strategic analytics, which suggests it's aligned to some kind of strategic priorities. But is that the way you've gone about prioritizing or is there some, um, you know, is there some other methods you've seen work for this? Yeah, that's a really good question. So especially with me um, supporting strategic analytics, I think it's important to think about like what are the overarching uh, goals of the business like from the top down. And from there, you can determine, you know, what are the functions where data can support those questions and initiatives. Mm -hmm. And from there, you think about what data do I have to support those various functions and initiatives and how can I leverage it? So there there will be situations where data could help this, but you don't have the data. There will be situations where data could help it, but it's going to take you know a long time to analyze the data to get it in a way that will actually support the function. And that mm-hmm. might be worth doing, but you have to prioritize it based on you know how much value will it add to the business, um, the resources that you have, have, the level of effort um, and how sustainable it is as well. So there's lots of lots of trade-offs in regards to, you know, should I be focusing on answering specific specific visit, sorry, business questions that are more ad hoc, or should I focus on building out dashboards? But that's all based on, you know, understanding what are the needs of the business. Because for one business, just providing visibility to their sales or engagement or something like that. Would be could be enough to get the ball rolling, but for other organizations, they might need answers to specific questions to help make a big business decision. Yeah, that's a good distinction, actually. Do you find more more value in uh, in enabling the organization to continually ask questions, um, hand you know, on their own or hands free, or is it this kind of um, you know, have a question, you know, ask the center? center will provide the the uh, the analytics and the insights so that you can make that decision you know, do you know what i mean so sort of like democratize it or keep it kind of within a within a function that that can provide a service to people to help answer that get those insights and answer those questions right i would always prioritize democratization because 
Um, the more things that you have automated, the more you have time to focus on those bigger strategic things. But they're both really important and they're both going to involve you still having an established relationship with your stakeholders. So even if I um, create dashboards where you can self-serve it, there's always going to be questions about those dashboards. And that gives me the opportunity yeah. to answer those and help you think about the most efficient way and effective way to use the dashboards. Um, so democratization is always going to be really important, but it's kind of like recognizing you're always going to get these ad hoc questions and supporting both, I think is really important. Yeah, no, really, 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 really good. And and that leads me to thinking about, you know, how you set yourself up. So, um, you know, different ways of structuring the data team, the individuals that are working on data, the individuals that are sort of interacting with data and insights. Um, so, yeah, so how, how have you seen or what are some of the best practices you've you've kind of um, you, you've lived by for structuring the data team? And and then my sort of second part, which we can come back to is sort of how do you then interact with the wider organization that kind of, you know, aren't the data team, but sort of in, are interacting with data and insights and the function that you've put together? Right. That's a good question. So one thing that I think is really important is that you have to think beyond just the data analysts. Um, so when you think about setting up a data function, you need data engineers to make sure the data is clean. You need the data analysts to analyze it and you need you know, data governance to make sure that everything is privacy compliant and there's no issues on that end. So I think those are like the three main areas that you really need to make sure you have in a solid spot, because if you have data that's not clean, the data that the analyze, analyst is analyzing, you know, is useless. So I think those three areas are really important. When it comes to how you're embedded in the organization, I think it's really important for data analysts, and that's the area I have the most experience with, to be um, pretty embedded with the stakeholders' uh, culture. So not necessarily sitting on the team of the marketing team or the finance team or anything like that, but actually having like a close relationship. So, you know, spending time in their weekly team meetings, um, understanding what are their main initiatives right now, being embedded that way. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to data engineers, they don't necessarily have to be embedded within a specific organization, but I think they have to have a pretty solid relationship with the data analyst because they need to make sure that the, the data is structured in a way that the analyst can use and then analyze and solve the, right. solve, solve the problems for the stakeholders. And then data governance is just one of those things that, you know, you have to have to make sure that everything's privacy compliant, make sure that there's no issues in regards to any concerns that could put the um, company in jeopardy. I love the, um, I've really heard of it, the, the sort of looked at this way, sort of um, embedding. I've heard of sort of people discuss and we've seen this and we recommend this sort of embedding yourself and, and your team and, and the understanding within a, another team that you're that you're working with to deliver analytics to but I like this idea of embedding in the culture I think understanding the culture because that does massively change the way you interact with them that might even change the the analytics the insights that are created um, but yeah embedding in the culture the team meetings you know the projects they're working on seeing them in action I think you mentioned you know you, you sat with the ticket sales team you know at the start of this um, in one of your roles. And I, I love the idea of getting involved in the culture of the teams and the team and the teams that you're, that you're either serving or working with. Um, that's a really, really nice way of, of, of putting it. Um, cool. So, um, so cool. Yeah. We sort of talked about um, what we've done. We've, we've talked about kind of uh, the things to consider, which I, I love your sort of like, you know, outcomes driven um, the ways of getting buy-in, building trust, building, proving sort of credibility. You talked about some of the best practices of setting up the team, but I think like where where this sort of really you know hits home is the kind of use cases that demonstrate the power of analytics. And I know we touched on some earlier about some of the sort of tactical wins that you've done early on to to demonstrate to sort of get off the ground, get people bought in, understanding. Um, but if you got, it'd be great to hear some examples from from your past of of kind of you know, some of those use cases that have really driven some success and, and some of the areas within, you know, some of these new new departments that you put together have, have sort of helped to, to move the uh, move the dial, I guess, for, for those organizations. You got, can you give some examples there? Yeah, I could probably speak to a couple in a high level. There's, I can't really speak to much in detail, but sure. um, 
it's cool because um, once you have the skill set of analytics, you can use it across industries and to support various different things. So um, I've had the opportunity to leverage data to help in the green lighting decision making process. So that's the process of determining if you should acquire a specific intellectual property to then develop into a film or a TV show. So that's right. been pretty cool to um, leverage all the data that we could have to support that. Um, also, in regards to, you know, driving ticket sales, thinking about the best way to promote a specific game should you be um advertising the player or should you be advertising like a specific ticket sales offer should you be advertising the specific like giveaway that night so i did a lot of um, a b testing in regards to what's most effective for driving ticket sales revenue in that way um and also just thinking about how to and drive engagement with ads i think thinking about you know if it's based on how the creative looks, based on if you're featuring the talent of a specific film or TV show, based on if you're promoting, uh, what's an example? I'm trying to think. There's, there's various, various cuts of trailers that may be more effective in targeting specific audiences. Right. So a lot of in the digital marketing that I was doing, it was thinking about, or not even thinking about, it was actually real time testing out how did engagement improve based on if we showed someone a trailer that's formatted in various different ways and recognizing that, you know, a, one cut of a trailer might work well for one particular audience, but for another audience, it might be a different cut. So there was a real, lot of real time optimizing of digital marketing campaigns to help drive engagement on the platform based on, you know, if we were seeing our marketing spend become more efficient. Cool. No, well, some, uh, some certainly some consistent themes there of, of, of um, you know, using some good solid insight to to help shape the business that you're uh, that you're working with, and 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 sort of really yeah, understand the consumer, understand the customer, understand the end product, and and make sure it's positioned in the best way. So, so some really some really good examples there. What, what I suppose just to kind of wrap wrap up, like what what's your what what inspires you most about this this kind of industry? What inspires you most about? What do you love most about being in the kind of data analytics space? So you clearly spent oh, a lot I of time in it. I love working in data. It's really funny because, and I feel grateful that I was able to fall into an industry and career that I loved just so early on, right out of college. Mm -hmm. But it kind of feeds into just who I am as a person. I'm a very inquisitive person, and I love researching. I love digging into things, and I love helping people. So mm -hmm. it's been able to. I've been able to use data. Um, me being a very like logically driven person to help people. So that's what really drives my passion with analytics. And, as I, and it's been a situation where I can help people do a lot of different things, whether it's to help drive revenue, whether it's help to make, you know, big strategic decisions, whether it's help to make marketing spend more efficient. It's like I've been able to use data in a lot of different ways to um, help make help make better decisions. So that's why I'm really passionate about it. And I love that I can apply it in any area. Great. Well, I, it's um, it's great to hear from someone who's sort of who've done, you know, tried and tested over and over again in lots of different places, because um, I think it sort of proves that the method and the approach and the best practice that you've that you've sort of been through and, and learned and, and uh, embedded within organizations is then successful and you've moved on to other places to kind of go and do the same thing. So look, really, really appreciate um, your time on, on the show. Thank you very much for coming on, for coming along. All right. Thank you for having me great no no worries and thanks everyone for listening i hope you enjoyed that and uh, we'll catch you again soon